Darkflow have revamped their entire Battle Pass model for the first season of 2023, making them more frequent, adding season icons, rebalancing military rank systems, and simplifying tasks. But what everybody cannot stop talking about are the five new gold weapons as part of this Battle Pass season, one of which is being touted as the best weapon in the game, and another implies that Darkflow are running out of cold weapon ideas. We'll begin with Pacific Axis's new gold weapon, the Type 1 SMG 1930, and there's a reason for this. The news release description says that you should subscribe. Come on, you don't want to upset the snail god now, do you? It actually says it's a prototype SMG from 1930 used in the capture of Shanghai, which means it was used in the early stages of the war, yet not necessarily the Pacific Island hopping campaign. But there's a more serious problem. This next part is copy-pasted from an online description of the Type 1 SMG normal version. In essence, is a prototype of a prototype, and nothing about an early version you can find online, because the Type 1 itself really was rare in itself. The historical research for this entire video, provided by a Discord server's resident historian, Pavel, says that only 50 pieces of the Type 1 itself were ever built, regardless of whether it was early or late. And considering we already have the standard Type 1 SMG on the Giretsu paratroopers, the premium squad that came with the Pacific Special Landing Forces pre-order pack, we can literally see there are virtually no differences whatsoever. They look the exact same, have the same damage, rate of fire, magazine size, weight, firing mode, and even shot dispersion, a hidden mechanic in the game. The only differences, for whatever reason, are minuscule reload time and recoil differences. But the reload time is more noticeable than the recoil, so we have to conclude that the early version is actually better than the standard version. Despite the Type 1 being rejected by the Japanese armed forces and never being chosen for mass production whatsoever or for international export. So, the statistical differences here can't even be blamed on cutting corners for production quantity during the war. The point is that Darkflow are clearly running out of ideas for gold weapons in the Japanese campaign. And the fact these two are so similar makes this blatantly obvious. And I predicted this exact phenomena to occur in two videos I made before the Pacific was even released. And these issues do not just plague the Type 1, but there are also two early versions of the Type 100 SMG in the game so far. One in the campaign tree, and the other a premium squad. And funnily enough, a late version is already added in the mission editor. I could then proceed to talk about the two versions of the S1 100 as well. You can see where I'm going with this. The developers don't really have any ideas, but it's not really their fault. You can kind of blame the Japanese military for this. Do you speak Japanese? Luckily for them though, Pavel's also suggested a possible gold weapon order they could actually use. The Tokyo Arsenal Model 1927, the first ever Japanese SMG, which unfortunately was deemed so bad that it was destroyed during army tests, but let's not think about that and think about the fact that it looks like the PPSH's son. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. Hmm. But if we ignore how not unique this weapon really is, and instead look at the Type 1's performance in game, it's actually pretty dang good statistically. I would personally say it's in the top three SMGs in the Pacific Axis campaign, and here's why. Comparing it against existing assault weapons in this campaign to prove it, we see it's better than the regular Type 1 in the Premium Squad, as already explained, and better than the S1 100 in the key areas, the rate of fire and magazine size. Yes, the S1 has slightly higher damage, lower recoil, and better reload time, but honestly, you won't notice these things, meaning that the Type 1 beats it. But it also beats the Premium Squad as part of the Pacific Starter Pack, which contains the exact same weapon. It also beats the Type 100 early for the exact same reasons, meaning that the Paratrooper Premium Squad version loses to it as well. The MP28 7.65mm gets actually very close with the same magazine size, but the Type 1 beats it minimally on almost every single metric. What you don't see, however, is that the MP28 has a much, much worse shot dispersion, a hidden statistic, than Japanese SMGs which sets further apart the Type 1 from it. Against the Type 2A though, it really comes down to personal preference. If you would prefer a higher rate of fire and lower recoil, then you pick this. But if magazine size is more up your street, then the Type 1 is still your destination. Lastly, the SIG beats the Type 1 because of its rate of fire, whilst simultaneously having all of its other stats very close to this new gold weapon. As a result, statistically, we've shown that it's either the second or third best SMG you can currently get and the ones that are better than it come very, very late in the campaign tree, meaning the Type 1 1930 is very viable for everyone, but especially so for the low Pacific Axis campaign levels. But what about in-game? Watch and listen to this.
this gold weapon gets a score of 5.9 out of 10 for my gold weapon leaderboard. Which sounds like a strange number, but I needed to sandwich it above the Schmeisser and Type Hay due to better fire rate and magazine size, and below the Degtirev PDM. Once again, for fire rate reasons. It's not exactly a unique weapon, and that keeps it below the score of 6 as well, but it is powerful in comparison to the rest of the campaign's weaponry. Stay tuned until the end of the video to see my full gold weapon order leaderboard and to put this score of 5.9 into context. Now that we've got that debate out of the way, we can now focus on a different weapon. The Kernda's MG, which for some reason Quadro struggles to pronounce in his video, but in reality, it's actually quite simple. Kernda's. I'm not even German and I'm pretty sure that is fairly close. Hi, good morning. Here to report the crime. Yeah. An international war crime, right? But in a similar vein to the Type 1 SMG, we can see evidence here of the devs struggling, but this time in their naming and historical accuracy. Pavel was keen to make it known that this thing is not actually the Kernders MG, but it's the Kernders MP, or Machinen Pistol in German, also known as the German name for submachine gun. The Kernders MG was a whole different weapon, despite them looking similar, which had an insane 2,200 200 rounds per minute fire rate, so honestly I'm actually very glad this MG version isn't actually in the game, <laughs> dear god. Only one prototype was made of them both however, hence the confusion, yet the devs are still calling it the MG. Perhaps the biggest indication that it's an SMG is that its damage is half as low in comparison to most machine guns because it uses pistol cartridge ammo, and be sure to slap a like on this video for Pavel if you appreciate his intense research on this area. Available in Normandy and Berlin for the Axis, it was a light SMG designed by August Kernders, hence the name, in the 1940s. But August was not actually a weapons designer by trade. He was an engineer and artillery designer, famous for the Röchling anti-fortress grenades and the V3 cannon, which was actually supposed to bombard London from the French port of Calais. And let me tell you, I'm glad they didn't bombard London because that's where I live. It could have been killed. His pedigree aside, the Kernders SMG and his true Kernders MG were rejected by the army, partly because he worked in the French Puteau arsenal and in the United Kingdom just before the war. So the high up in Germany distrusted him, in comparison to all the other German machine guns in the entire game, which I actually put already in a list about a year ago which you can watch up here. The Kernders does only half as much damage. This instantly means it's significantly worse than all the MGs in this campaign because of its damage per second stat. That's its biggest downside, and likely explains why it's actually classified as an SMG in game. So it can actually compete that I felt betrayed. Against Normandy Axis's STG, one of the best assault weapons in the entire game, it starts to show its class. It has a third less damage than the STG and double the horizontal recoil, which in some cases can matter a lot, but it has double the rate of fire, half the vertical recoil and over triple the magazine size. But the massive thing you can't see here in the stats is the Kernders' shot dispersion of 0.9, which in comparison to the STG is huge. Now I still think this weapon is actually very good, but it's is it actually better than the STG and its family, like the MP43-1 and the MKB? Honestly, it's too hard for me to give an unbiased answer, and a lot of it really is personal preference, as they excel in different areas. It's the exact same comparison as the PPSH to the Fedorov Automat. Both are very good weapons, but people prefer different ones. Statistically, the STG and the Fedorov are better, but you can make up your own mind right now. Sure! The Kernders gets a score of 7.5 out of 10, significantly higher than the Type 1 SMG earlier, and higher than the M1 E5 Garand due to its rate of fire, magazine size and recoil, but it's lower than the VMP and the M2A1 Carbine because of its bad shot dispersion and lower damage. And as I said though, some people would rate it much higher than I am, especially as it is a very unique and very worthwhile to use if you are a low campaign level in Normandy or Berlin Axis. Tunisia Axis's new Scotty Mod X is the gold weapon that I don't see anybody really talking about, but it's quite interesting. It was designed in 1932 by Alferrero Scotti, and the X is not referring to any model number. In fact, the X stands as reference to the 10th anniversary of the March on Rome, after which Benito Mussolini took power in Italy. And the fascist regime there often dated items on a calendar beginning from October 1922, which is the date they took power. Only 250 pieces of this thing were ever built, and it was tested 
hosted extensively from 1935 to 39, alongside the Breda PG and the Armagera Mod 39, which is already in game. It saw some limited field use in the Second Italo Abyssinian War and in early fights during World War II, which makes it unique as far as this batch of gold weapons go, as it was basically the only one that was actually used during World War II, despite it being actually quite unlikely it was used in Tunisia, the campaign in which it's located in. It was not formally adopted by the Italian military, however, rejecting it in favour of the Armagera. Gun lovers out there, though, will also appreciate its uniqueness in another area, the fact that it fires from an open bolt, which was really uncommon amongst most rifles of the era, and actually means it reloads quicker than most of the other semi-automatic rifles in this campaign. In-game, it's very comparable to the Armagera, as expected from its history. It has a lower shot dispersion, which is great, higher damage, and a lot lower of a reload time for the same magazine size, but it is slower to fire and has a little more recoil. So honestly, it's worthwhile using if you're looking for something a bit more unique and different. But if you're looking for something that was more powerful than existing stuff in that campaign, then I honestly wouldn't recommend it. That being said, the ZH-29 is significantly better than it in many aspects and is what you should go for in this campaign if you want power. The Gewehr 41 is also better than it, and I'd also give the Pavesi M42, the other Italian gold weapon semi-automatic rifle that I reviewed in this video, a slightly better rating than it due to better damage and rate of fire, even though it has a noticeably higher reload time and recoil. But once again, the decision to get this weapon really is just personal preference. It's a fun alternative to other Italian rifles, but will struggle in the late campaign. But perhaps you can decide right now. The Scotty gets a score of 4.8 out of 10, just below the Pavesi, but significantly higher than the low power weapons like the Gewehr 1888. It's an interesting purchase to mix things up, but in raw power terms, uh, it's not great. The unique version of the Lanchester, the Lanchester Model 1, is available in Normandy, Tunisia and Pacific campaigns for the Allies, and is another weapon that nobody seems to be talking about as part of this battle pass. But this time, it makes little sense, as this weapon is actually very good. This weapon was an attempt to lighten the Lanchester Mark 1 SMG, and one prototype of it was ever made in 1940. It's an all-metal SMG with a non-wooden stock, but the rest of the components are practically the same as the Mark 1, despite it looking very, very different. Essentially, the finished product was nothing more than a stripped-down Lanchester Mark I. It actually had very good results during the British Army's tests, but the Sten gun was already confirmed for production, so it just lost out and was stored away. Strangely, it had holes in the rear end to allow a folding stock to be added, but there are no records of this weapon ever having a stock. There was actually a Model 2 also made to improve upon this Model 1, but suffered a similar phase to the Sten. In-game is where this thing shines, however. Comparing the Model 1 and the Mark 1, the standard Lanchester version we see in game, one thing sticks out immediately the fire rate differences, but it also has better vertical recoil at the cost of more horizontal, which is actually double. Honestly though, in my book, this still makes the Model 1 better than its standard version. If you compare it against Normandy's current best SMG, the M1928A1 Thompson with box magazine, I would almost prefer this Lanchester Model 1 to it, as it's simply better in all areas apart from one big thing, its damage. The Thompson just edges it for me with its damage, but it's still quite close. As a result, I can still say wholeheartedly that this this thing is one of the most underrated gold weapons in the entire game. It looks super unique and has a very high DPM. The only real downsides are its horizontal recoil, which does need to be managed, as it is a lot higher than normal and for most other SMGs. And I would also advise not to use it in Tunisia, as the 50 round drum magazine Thompson is the best Thompson in the entire game and beats it by some distance, but Normandy and Pacific are prime targets for it, considering the lower quality of the existing arsenal of SMGs there. But let's see if you agree upon watching it.
it scores a solid 7.2 out of 10 for me, as it's better than the Data Rev PDM in basically all metrics, but I would rather use the Kerners we saw earlier over this due to its magazine size, better recoil and fire rate, as well as the fact it's lighter, meaning you move faster while holding it, than the supposed light version of the Lanchester Model 1. And last but not least, how could I forget about the aptly named LAD, or LAD, <laughs> machine gun. And as you can see, man is in the past, almost two and a half centuries in the past, late 18th century, don't know about that thing. And also, as you can see, man is repping the man's in red, AKA the British Empire crew, from London to the West Indies, all day, every day, repping those ends, don't know. Available in only Berlin for the Allies. It has this name because its three designers were named, oh, am I supposed to say this? Things. It has this name because its three designers were named, and bear with me, Liuti, Afanasev, and Dakin. But it's funny that they put them in this exact order, and they forged it in late 1942. Dakin, the D of the group, actually wait now, that sounds really dodgy. Don't say that out loud ever again. Oh my god. Was the co-creator of the AK-47. There were only two prototypes of the LAD ever made, as it was unsuccessful in tests, and both are currently in a museum in St. Petersburg. It was belt-fed, like the Kernders, but this time actually is a machine gun. Despite being an assault weapon, yeah, I don't know either, to be honest. Don't even ask. I, I don't know. I'm not dark flow. Do, you, do I look like a snail, bro? With 150 rounds per magazine, as reflected in game, chambered for the Tokarev pistol cartridge, once again, similar to the Kernders, with a bipod this time that makes it a machine gun in literally every sense of the word, apart from by the enlisted developers' classification. <laughs> It's only my third day out here, I don't know. Damn. It was the inspiration for the RD-44 and the Cold War's famous RPD. In game though, we can compare it to the RD-44, which is the last machine gun unlock in the same campaign. And once again, we come across a trade-off. If you prioritise the magazine size and recoil, then the LAD is for you. But damage, fire rate and shot dispersion is the combination I think I'd prefer. So the RD-44 is better in my mind. But that being said, I would actually prefer the early level DT-29 to the RD-44, so maybe it's once again again not ideal to compare the LAD to other machine guns in this campaign, as after all, it is apparently an assault weapon. Against the Fedorov, the LAD loses fairly badly in my opinion, as it does half as much damage per bullet for the exact same fire rate. But against the PPSH, it loses again as it has half the fire rate with the same bullet damage, and is a lot heavier despite the PPSH being one of the heaviest SMGs. So basically, it's got lower DPM than both the Fedorov and the PPSH. You could even go down the tree to the PPS4. And honestly, only then would I say that the LAD actually beats it. The Soviets do have some really top quality SMGs to use, so it's almost only natural that the LAD actually looks bad compared to them. The point is, this weapon is very unique to use, and fun to use, and not bad by any stretch of the imagination. But when you put it into context, relative to the only campaign it is in, and the existing assault weapons within it, it struggles. A lot. Now, I would still buy this, as you can literally fire it for 10 years and never need to reload. Plus it's fun to collect and have something a little bit different to use for your soldiers, and I personally value that really highly in a gold weapon. But if you only care about the best of the best weapons in the game, then this probably isn't for you. But maybe for you, I'm wrong. If you like this gameplay, you can see right now. Need cover! My score for the lad of all lads is 6.5 out of 10. This is because, despite it appearing similar to the Kernders, it actually has significantly lower DPM due to a much lower fire rate, and I prefer the Lanchester Model 1 for the same reason. Though it's above the Degti Rev because the LAD is basically the same thing, but has five times the magazine size, which is really a bad thing. It's not a bad weapon, but it's not amazing. Maybe it truly is, therefore, only for lads. So finally, here's my overall gold weapon leaderboard with every single 
single gold weapon I've reviewed on this channel. But bear in mind that buffs and nerfs to weapons in recent months have adjusted some of my scores, reflected in the green and red arrows for a score improving or falling respectively. But do you agree with my scores? Let me know in the comments down below. You'll also notice that the Gewehr 43 Kurt is at the top, and the reasons why you need to get as many of these as possible are in this video. And you should watch it. Not should. Must. It's really that important, if I'm being honest with you. It's there.